Thank you very much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show, episode 137. On today's episode, we're going to talk about five elements of storytelling with photography. Hi, thanks very much for joining us. My name is William Beam. My name is Lee Beam. And we are here to help photographers become better visual storytellers so they can take better photos to share, sell, and remember. All right, we talk about storytelling quite a lot on this podcast, and I thought, you know what, we could probably dive just a little bit deeper and we want to help you learn why storytelling is important to your photography. We want to help you understand how you can incorporate these elements into your photography. And of course, how to use storytelling to create your unique voice in photography. So those are some of the things we're going to be going through when we talk about these elements. And I want to start off with, you know, what does it mean, Lee, to be a visual storyteller? To me, it is it is the difference between just putting up a photo, which is a picture, and actually communicating with somebody visually on a deeper level. I think you're absolutely right. You're talking about communicating an idea, a concept, a feeling, an emotion. In other words, you don't want someone just to look at the photo and say, yeah, there's a photo. You want them to understand the purpose of the photo and what it's actually trying to say to you. The photo to me usually draws somebody in and there's different ways to do this. If you're just having a photo put up, for example, in a gallery or any other situation where you don't have a caption or you don't have the ability to put text there, there's almost a bigger responsibility on you to make sure that everything that you want to convey is captured within that photo. And that includes the way that you're going to process it, the way you light it, the way you frame it, basically everything. I'm, we're probably going to go into that a little bit later on. There's also another side to it. I mean, a lot of people now are sharing a photo in a context where you put a little caption or a description or a paragraph or maybe more about it. The photo is the draw. So that photo has to at least communicate something either as a feeling or as a, an emotional reaction somehow that gets the person to read what you want them to read. So whether or not you have the text, that photo has a purpose and it all revolves around your ability to communicate with people. And this goes back, I mean, I hate to say it because it always sounds cliche. It goes back to cave drawings. People were trying to communicate an idea. They're trying to leave a message behind for someone else. If you look at, it doesn't have to be photographed. We're talking about still life images. And it's like, okay, this was our hunt. If you move forward into Renaissance eras or other paintings, stuff like that, they'll show you what daily life looked like. They'll show you the important people that were part of their society. Even a still life that just showed window light coming in on a kitchen table setting said something, it communicated something about this is what our life is like. And I think that is kind of part of what it means to be a visual storyteller. And before I really accepted or adopted this idea, I would go off and take travel photos that I thought in, in my mind, the idea was I want to make whoever's looking at this want to go to that place. Yeah. And I had such a different way of storytelling in my photos, but, but that was, I, that I was totally kind of get that now. Yeah. That was kind of before I was really thinking about storytelling. I just thought, you know, like this is a beautiful place. I want to share it in such a way that I want people to say, you know what, I'd like to go there and see that for myself, which is not a bad goal into itself, but it wasn't necessarily storytelling. I think it captures some of the storytelling aspects. You probably just look at it differently now because your mindset was different then. When you post a photo and your intention is to make somebody look at it and want to be there, there has to be a reason why. So even if that's because you've made it beautiful, you've made it look mystical, you've made it whatever mood you've put in there, you have got a story in there. The difference is that then you probably didn't know what your story was, even though it was there. I think you're So right. you weren't in control of what your story was, whereas now you're looking at the story before the photo, whereas then you had the photo and hoped there was a story. I think you're absolutely right. And it was, the same thing happened with portraits, you know. My idea then was, all right, can I go take a picture of a pretty girl in the studio? And I was working more honestly with how do I compose this? You know, what tools am I using? How am I lighting it? I wasn't necessarily thinking about what is my subject conveying to anybody else? Mm -hmm. And I think you can do a story in a stark environment with a studio and, and lighting, but it takes a bit more expression and emotion than I was pulling out of my subjects at the time. That's true. And it also depends who you're connecting with. 
and who you want to connect with. Because there are some people who literally look at everything as face value. So the pretty girl is going to draw in a lot of people. But those people don't stick because there's no depth to what brought them in. Exactly. There's, And we're going to get to one of the elements of why those photos don't stick. You know, there's people who go look at a pretty girl and this, that, that's nice. You can flip through Instagram and see, you know, thousands of pretty girls. But it's you, in the moment. But you just kind of flick through them. One, two, three, four. And it's like... What makes you stop and really look at a photo? And those are hopefully some of the things that we're going to be going over. So I want to start talking about the five elements of storytelling and photography that we're going to bring here. And the first one is setting. In other words, no matter what kind of photo, whether it's going to be a portrait, a landscape, or something, Lee, you were working on earlier today with your food photography, mm -hmm. the setting tells you something about the story. Yeah. And I used, I took two photos with two complete, it was in the same place there were very different moods to, to each of them. That was deliberate. And well, let's kind of go over your example. This is, you know, a top down food photography shot. Yeah. But I had two things. I was talking about breakfast. Um, I'm not going to go into this because it's totally irrelevant to this, but I had a history of liking to eat soup for breakfast for nutritional reasons. Not everybody wants soup for breakfast, but I looked and I thought there are seasons, there's summer, there's fall. It's always summer in, in Florida, but there's certain colors let's say fresh, vibrant summertime. And there are also different colors, you know, the more earthy tones and things, and maybe a little bit darker, not as bright, let's say fall. And I used that with the, the soup and I used the bright kind of vibrant colors for the summery one. It was basically a two options. They're both equally as good, but we don't all like the same things. But the idea of the setting was you were using color and texture to give or convey some kind of emotion about what you were feeling about the food that you had. Yeah. And we can do the same thing with a number of other types of photography. So if I'm looking at a portrait, where is my subject going to be? I mean, if you put someone in a gym, that's one setting. If you put someone inside of a honky tonk bar with kind of smoke and haze in the background, those are things that are going to tell something about your, where you're at and what your subject is. That's true. Yeah. So, and even, even just within landscape photography, your environment is the setting that you're sharing with it, but it doesn't mean that you just show up whenever you please and click the shutter. Part of your setting, particularly outdoors, is going to be making use of the light or the environment. There are places where you, people love to go see frequent uh, landscape photographs, but you can only take those shots sometimes at certain times of the day and other times only certain times of the year. That's true. Yeah. So, so for example, Thor's Well in Oregon is this is one of the places I really wanted to go to when I was kind of interested in landscape photography. And if you're not familiar with it, there's a rocky coastline on the Pacific in Oregon, and there's this great big crater hole opening. If you get there at the right time of year and time of day, when the high tide comes in, the water shoots into the rocks and goes exploding up out of the crater. And you, you need to do that also, not just any time of day, but you kind of want to do that when you've got a nice sunset. I mean, this is West Coast, so sunrise is not going to have the light in the side of the photo that you want to, un unless you're going to brave <laughs> being in the breakers at high tide on, <laughs> on those rocks. I don't think so. Uh, but in order for high tide to coincide with sunset to get the kind of shot, at least though, as the way I envisioned it, that was the setting. You can only do that at certain times of the year. You can't just show up any day that you want to and, and take that photo. That's true. But here's an ex that, that's a perfect example of people who aren't thinking about storytelling, although they are creating beautiful photos. I mean, there are some beautiful photos. That's like a lot of skill and talent that have gone into not only taking the photo, but the post-processing elements. And I guess when you're starting off in photography, all of us have gone and looked at photos that we think are amazing. And a lot of the times if you search not very hard, you find that there are thousands and thousands of the same photo taken by different people and i guess you move on from there you know you've moved on when you realize i i don't want something that everybody's done unless i can do it really differently i agree and to me those are trophies i mean i look at that as trophy hunting you saw a photo that someone else took it was beautiful it was perfect you said i want to take that same photo and you go off to mesa arch or you go off to thor's well for example at the right time of year and you get that shot with just the right settings, just the right light, you know, just the perfect time. You get the backlight coming up on the water as it's shooting up and it looks outstanding. But a lot of people have done that before and it's like, how is yours different? 
Yeah, that's exactly it. You want to put your own story into the picture. Which brings me to the second part of our uh, five elements of storytelling is character. And as much as I used to like to enjoy going off and taking photos like that, I've realized that every single one of those, I think, would have been made better if there was a person in front of it. That's true. I used to have this rule that I didn't take photos without a person there. I, I'm kind of, I'm not there yet, but I understand it. And what character would you put in that scene? I mean, you're going to have a, a pirate there with a silk sash around his belt and a sword in the air. You're going to have a surfer there. Are you going to have, you know, I don't even know, someone who's riding the, the waves to the top. Of the... Well, you know, for me, when I started, I mean, this was before I understood anything about photography. This was before I even really had a, a, any special kind of camera. I was just shooting with something very, very basic. And we're not even talking about DSLR level yet. I went to my, my story was about my memories of what I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was always about the people who were with me. I, I got into the detail shots and the scrapbooking and stuff. I was already into it, but I used my photography in that at a later stage. And I saw a different way of taking story, you know, telling a story through photography. But initially, I always wanted a person in my photo. And when I'm taking family memories or some kind of memories where my family is involved, I always want a person in the photo because that is my story for that one. And it's not always necessarily to share out publicly. No, it's not. And if you think about vacation photos, those are two main elements that you really need in storytelling, a person in a place. Yep. And, you know, that's the story of your family, your friends, your life. We're doing something someplace that we really enjoy being, or maybe we're getting scared to death in this place. I don't, yep. <laughs> I don't know. What are, you choose the emotion. Yeah. And character is one of the things that I think really drives us forward. And that can cover a number of things from whether who you're choosing to be in your photograph, what expression they're going to bring. We see a lot of models with kind of dead, empty expressions that really don't have any character to them at all. Most of the models that i'm seeing lately are like that. i'm not talking i'm not actually knocking any photographers i'm just talking about like looking at product photography and brands i, I, I don't know what it is it seems like it's this latest trend to look as dead as possible i know skulls are a thing now but basically these are skulls with skin over it. that's there's nothing else to it so we're looking for a character when we're looking at a subject and i think since I'm working with athletes now, we're seeing a lot more of that. Yes. There is a personality and a character inside. Oh, yeah. Particularly the, the lady that we shot with last time and we're going to be shooting again this coming <laughs> she's weekend. Great. She, she's fun and she is a character. She's But she's got an interest that we're showing in this. We've got a setting for her. She's she's definitely expressive. Oh, yes. But that's exactly what you want. And those are the things that kind of pull you in. The third element that we want to bring in is plot. Ooh. Well, and it sounds, you know, serious, but it's like, what is the story about? Hmm. You know, so you've got a person in a place, but what's moving them? What's driving them? And does that come through in your photograph? Is that where your mood comes in? It's part of it. Yes. I mean, that's, that's part of it. Your setting can help set the mood. The way your character is dressed or expresses his or herself can set the mood. You know, what, who you choose to be your character can be part of the mood as well. Think about some of the creepy old movies from the 50s. You know, those black and white ones where they had those ghoulish expressions. Yes. It's like Abbott and Costello meet the mummy or, or you know, something <laughs> like that. There's always some creepy guy around. That's that's telling, you know, part of your story. But what's the plot? You know, like these people stumble across something. They've got to figure out a problem and then get out to the other side. I don't know what your plot is. I don't, honestly, I don't care. But if I see a photograph that I see a setting, a character, and a plot as as part of it, that then you've really got something there. One of the people I see on 500px.com who does this very well with composites is, uh, I think it's Adrian Sommeling, and I'll, I'll put a link to his page in there. And he takes his son and he does composites. It could be as simple as he's running for the train and holding his son flying through the air behind him as they're trying to get on board. <laughs> it, he, they make all these wonderful stories and there's something going on in each one of these photographs. It's not like these events are really happening, but they're coming out of his imagination and they're, they're constructing the photograph to tell you that story. And that that's plot. I mean, that tells you that not only are these people here, but they're not just standing around. They're moving through something, whether it's emotionally or physically. I love movement within a photograph, or at least the, the impression of movement. 
The fourth item on our list is conflict. And you probably don't even think about this in a lot of cases when you're taking a photograph, but conflict drives story. I like conflict in a photo. And well, give me an example. Tell me, tell me what you're thinking about when, with conflict. Conflict can be color. It can be a subject against a setting where the subject and the setting are just so completely almost like polar opposites. And it it actually stops somebody because when something doesn't fit, they go, wait, what? It's not an accident like, oh, well, this wasn't very well done because why would he or she be doing this or be sitting here? But when you go, oh, how did that nice girl end up in that dodgy looking setting or, mm -hmm. or vice versa? How did this person end up, you know, in this very eloquent looking? <laughs> and, and conflict is really just that. It's like there's some kind of obstacle to overcome or how did this person get in this place? The the photograph I had in mind from Adrian Sommeling with his child, you know, trying to catch the train, that's the conflict. It's like, oh, we're, we're rushing to catch it, the train. A lot of people can relate to that. They understand that it's like the conflict is if I don't make it, you know, there's something gone wrong. If I screw up, I'm going to fall off the platform. Who knows? There's, there's conflict. Yeah, that would inherent. be so bad. But sometimes conflict is putting a person in a place where they don't belong. I would, one of the things I remember are some of the photos that Joe McNally does when or did when he was uh, taking photographs for the Olympics and you saw what do they call the gymnast who's on a beam I, I don't even know what the name is for that but he put that person in a cornfield and he was taking athletes and putting them in different parts of America there was a skier who was on top of I think the Chrysler building in New York and I don't know the buildings in New York very well so I could very well be wrong but the idea was you take someone out of their natural element and put them someplace else. The story is this person's representing America, whether it's from the cornfield in the heartland or a skier on top of a skyscraper in New York. There was a story there and there was conflict within that. Yeah. Because they, I would hate to take that first step to ski off that story. <laughs> but conflict doesn't have to mean that there's a fight or there's something tremendously dangerous at hand. It's making two things that don't go together or work together to tell a story. Yeah, there's there's something to overcome and or something to think about. And it could be an emotional conflict as well. And that means that you also have your choice of, of colors to, to show this conflict. And you've got a number of storytelling elements that we're going to get to in a moment. All right, the final one that I wanted to bring along is theme. What's the theme of your photograph? You got a setting, you got a character, you got a plot, you got conflict. But what is your overall theme? What ties all of these elements together? So is the theme that these are our vacation stories? Is the theme that this is what life is like in Italy? It's the story of your journey. It's the story. The, yeah. It's the story that ties. Time. Yeah. It's, it's, I hate to say it's the story that ties all the story elements together. That's not really what I mean. It's a thread that ties the story together. In a, in a sense, yes. There needs to be some kind of a theme. And if you think back to movies, you know, they each have a theme. Is this a thriller? Is it a comedy? Is it a Western? It's something that you look at and you kind of recognize. It ties all the elements together. So it falls into a category. So, yeah. What is the theme or the category that your photos kind of fall into? Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't have to be complex. None of these things have to be complex. But if you start thinking about them, you start planning your photo and what you're going to, what your result is going to be before you ever pick up the camera. Okay, so we talked about the five elements of storytelling and photography. Now here's the real question is, how do I use storytelling in my photography? And the first thing that comes to mind for me is lighting. You know, are you there on a bright, cheery day? Are you there in darkness with just a little sliver of light? How are you gonna use lighting? Does it have color? Does it have direction? Those are, to me, some of the most important choices that you're going to make. I mean, Lee, with your food photography, did you, you had an idea of what you wanted to show, but was it something that this is going to be a, a bright, clear picture? Is it something that's going to be in shadow? What did you have in mind for how you were going to put that together? Actually, I kind of had one of each. It wasn't so much that one was in shadow, but the one was going to be a little bit darker and a slightly underexposed and on purpose. And the other one was ridiculously bright. And that was also deliberate because of the mood, because one was supposed to be kind of a light and airy, almost a carefree feeling like it, it was a summery or spring feeling you kind of picture bouncing around in that kind of mood and the other one was kind of maybe subdued tones a little bit warmer more comforting and it was a quieter photo mm. 
And think about this in a portrait. The light that you use on a toddler, you know, with a nice bright smile on her face is going to be different than the light that you may want to use on a boxer or a football player. You kind of want to use darkness and shadow to conceal some things. And you want to show maybe maybe a more aggressive stance with an athlete that's ready to compete versus, you know, a toddler who just comes bouncing in. You know how they kind of wobble when they walk yeah. with a big smile on their face. And, and your lighting is going to help you tell the appropriate story for your subject. Likewise, your lens choice is going to do the same thing. That's true. Are you going to be going for something wide to bring in this vast, grand environment that you're shooting? Or do you really want to narrow things down and get close and tight on the face? <laughs> do you know, honestly, I didn't really. I just used the lens that was on my camera. It was a case of roll with what you have. Yeah, but the, what you had on your camera was a zoom lens. You still made a choice. I still made a choice, yeah. I mean, if I'd had a prime lens, I would have had to seriously consider, will this work or will it not? Or likewise, if I had a 7300 on there. It wouldn't work I, with that. It wouldn't have worked because had a very my short ladder. little legs would not allow me. <laughs> and, you know, you use, sometimes you use what you have. Sometimes you make practical choices for what you're going to use for a lens. But it's not necessarily just the focal length that you're looking at a lens. You're also looking at depth of field. Yeah. Do you need to show everything from front to back or do you need to isolate your subject in a shallow depth of field and kind of blur off that background? Those are storytelling mechanisms that you have. And this is one, Lee, you just brought up was the use of color. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose the colors that you did for the photo you just shot? I, basically, I was showing choices and I was showing that there's not always one right way to make a choice. And one had warm, kind of comforting tones, and that sort of went with the food that was over there. And the other one was kind of more springy and vibrant. The short story is that the nutritional value and the macros in there, which is like, you, you know, the breakdown of your nutrients, um, were pretty much the same in each of those two photos. But there are different ways to get it. And what I wanted to put out was to kind of not extremes, but, you know, opposite ends and just say there's there's more than one right way to do things. We don't all like the same stuff. All right. The next one is particularly going to be for a portrait. And I'm typically thinking of a human portrait, but it might work if you've got a dog that you like too. And that's expression. I like dogs. I like dogs too. And like people, dogs go through a number of different expressions as well. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I really admire dog breath photography. If you've ever seen Kelly Greer's photos, she just has wonderful use of color, but also fantastic expressions on the dogs that she photographs. It, I, and I've, I watched like a Kelby One video of how she, you know, training how she does this. And she's got an assistant who's getting the attention of the dog. But I, they look so delighted and yes. so happy to be there. And like, maybe there's sometimes like a little paw coming forward. Those are wonderful expressions. She's like, I wish my dog looked like that. And sometimes they do. We've got three dogs and... My, my my portraits of the dogs are, are not quite as um, expressive as that. Well, we have to get them to sit in one space for like one 250th of a second, which is quite a challenge in itself. Right, right now, though, it's like of our three dogs, my favorite is we've got a black Labrador named Lola. And I happened to click the shutter while her tongue was just kind of going around the edge of her mouth. <laughs> and I thought, that's Lola. That, yep. that got Lola's, you know, character who she is, in there. That kind yeah. of character. But that was her expression at the time. If you're photographing a person or a model, it depends on are you trying to coax an expression out of them or are you capturing them in a moment? We go back again to like the vacation photos. And if you see your child coming around on a merry-go-round or, you know, whatever other ride and they've got this joyous expression on their face, I would really want to zoom in on that and not worry so much about getting the ride in there. I just want to see like that's a happy moment while yes. we're on vacation. I've actually got some. I need to have a look at my albums. I've probably got some prints of Tove on, on little rides like that. Mm -hmm. But expression doesn't always have to be happy. It's not like you're always going to go in front of your subject and say, okay, big smile. I know some people really get tired of hearing that. I didn't ever do that, actually. I, I despised. <laughs> when, before I knew anything about photography, I always hated posed photos. My photos were like, just do what you're doing. And I'd sit there and wait. And I just had a simple little digital camera with maybe five megapixels. But I, I did not like everybody else had posed photos. And they're so, you know, you flick through because I like to print things. And you start flicking through an album and you look and every single one is somebody going, geez, I, I really didn't want that. No. And when I'm working with models, I'm talking to them. And sometimes I'm trying to crack them up. Sometimes I'm trying to upset them. I just want an expression. And I, you know, it's like, if I want a mean look from them and I'm work, you know, I'm looking straight in their face, I, the best way that I know 
to get a mean look out of you know some of the female models I work with. It's like, man, your thighs look a little fat. And, and there, I've got a very short window <laughs> to get my photo. Yeah, don't mess it up. Make sure your focus is good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, maybe I don't say it quite that way, but you, you know what I'm saying is like it's you and you've got to be quick to come back and say, I'm just kidding. It was just to get the expression. Some some models are very, very good. They know their expressions. They know how to give you a coy little look. They know how to give you attitude. They know how to smile. Others are new to a, working with photography and they haven't experienced that yet. So you kind of tweak them along that way. At least I do. Yeah, that, that helps. And not everybody is a model. <laughs> you know, sometimes that you're taking photos of people who only have one look, you need to think that, all right, this is not a person whose job is to be a model. So he or she needs a little bit of help trying to get a different expression. And it's up to you as a photographer saying, what is the story I'm going to tell and what expression really serves that? All right. We talked a little bit about set design and choice of location, but those are part of your storytelling elements as well. Where are you going to put your subject? And if you're a landscape photographer, you're going to go to your subject. Yeah. But I kind of think that most of the photography, particularly most of the photography that I do, isn't a matter of just going someplace and taking a shot of what's there. There's going to be some direction as far as not only choosing where am I going to go, but what am I going to put in the photo? So to me, that's part of the set design. And set design itself means, you know, you may not go someplace. You may have to simply build your environment yeah. where you're at. And that's what you did with your, with your product and yes. food photos. So you're, you take it in the same spot all the time, but it's what you bring to design this, the background of those photos that really makes it what yeah, it is. Yeah, that actually takes longer than taking the photos. The final part of storytelling in your photography is emotion. And that's not necessarily talking about an emotion of a subject. It's what emotion do you want the viewer to take away from your photo? Yes. When you're taking pictures of food again, and I keep going back to that because it's fresh in our mind, but... Yeah. The emotion isn't, oh, I'm hungry, is it? It really isn't. Um, I, this is something where you're looking, you know, we, we eat for different reasons. And aside from that, we're hungry. But even when we are hungry, there are different things that we want. And sometimes you just want something comforting. And that's maybe based on your emotion at the time or the emotion you want to feel at the time. Or maybe the weather or external factors. And I had polar opposites there. And the color, the setting, even the textures that I used um, in the warm one, they were more earthy. They were, there was a bit more texture in there. And I used a little bit of contrast in there so that it wouldn't look too... You can use it either way. But what I wanted was to put a little bit of contrast in there. And, but what do you want someone to feel when they see the photo? I, I wanted them to look at it and think, this looks comforting. This looks like it will make me feel good. I need this. Exactly. It's like you could do this like... Maybe it's helping out with a story like this is a, you know, I've got a recipe and I want to bring this and someone might be curious about that. But usually when I'm looking at food photos that I really enjoy, I'm not thinking about how do I make it? I'm not thinking about I'm hungry. I'm thinking about, oh, wow, that looks really good. It makes me feel something because of an experience I've had before. Yeah. And look, for example, if you live in a really cold place and be using food photography because we're talking about it now, you're living somewhere cold. It's the middle of winter. My little summary berries and uh, Greek yogurt and whatever else with its bright colors, that is definitely not really going to appeal to you because you're cold and instinctively you're looking for things that make you feel warm and comforting. You might, you, you, know what? you would I, like my I whole stuff. I don't know if I agree with that because, and here's what I'm thinking. If I were snowed in someplace, I would be thinking about summer. And if I could see a photo that looks like summer and some refreshing treat that I might have in the summer, that would actually make me happy. It'll make you, I, I guess that's true. It makes you happy to look at it. And maybe this is the fine line that you're bringing up between, you know, do, do, what do you want the person to do once they feel the emotion? If you just want them to feel the emotion, then I guess you, you're absolutely right. Um, if you want somebody to make a choice based on the emotion, then you got to think a little bit deeper into it. One of the other examples I have is I've got a photograph of the Lincoln Memorial and not inside, you know, we're looking at the statue of Abraham Lincoln, but outside we see the columns, you see the massive steps leading up there. And there's one man in a business suit sitting off in the corner at the top of the steps and, you know, kind of smoking a cigarette. And he's just the way he's holding his hands and, and he's got his legs there. He's thinking, I need a place to sit down and think. It's like that one man to me makes the photo. Yeah. He wanted his space. And that's what I thought is like, you know, you've got this massive set of architecture, you've got all the meaning and stuff behind it, but the photo isn't about the building or the columns or the steps. It, it's about the one man. 
and you're looking at him and thinking, is he sad? Is he relieved? And you could kind of probably walk away with a few different ideas or, or thoughts about how you interpret that photo. One of the things I like about a photo or a painting is that some of them are open to interpretation. You can take them however you want to take them. Yeah. Actually, that's very true. And I did this once. It was an experiment when I was first learning about emotion in photography. I was out at a German market. It was cold. It was snowing. And I took a photo with a telephoto lens of, no, it wasn't a telephoto lens because I, I was I had overheard this couple's conversation. Basically, it was a, a man and a woman. They were all bundled up. And they both had their phones and she said, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. I've got it here. And they were actually having a moment together. They both standing kind of slightly turned from each other, staring at their phone screens. And I took a photo and I thought, you know, that I could tell two different stories. Mm -hmm. I posted it in two completely different places. And with the one I said, I had some kind of caption that I don't remember what it was, but it sort of suggested that we're so locked into, we're not tuned into each other anymore. And in the other one, it kind of suggested the connection between them. I actually had to remove the photo um, because people got so aggressive in their comments about the one with where it suggested that they were um, basically ignoring each other. It's funny. It was the same picture. And But that's the power of both suggestion and storytelling. And I didn't state anything in there. I just put a caption on there. I, I put a title to the photo. That was it for each one. But it suggested something and that kind of almost channeled somebody in a certain direction. And that's where they went. And all of them went that way. Not one person said, well, what if they were or do you know that for sure? On both sides, everyone just took that little couple of words and went, this is where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. And that really brings us back to a question that you can start asking yourself is, what is your visual voice telling you to create? It doesn't matter what genre of photography it is but how you put it together and how you can use these five elements of storytelling and also the tools at your disposal can really make the difference in how you create and craft your next photograph. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. We really appreciate you. And we would invite you to subscribe to this podcast. If you're listening on a mobile device, go ahead and click it right now to subscribe. And if you're not there, go to williambeam.com slash iTunes. It'll take you over to the iTunes page where you can subscribe. And we'll be happy to have you and we'll get the show to you, delivered to you every week. If you're interested in portrait photography, I've got a free ebook for you. It's called Creative Portraits. And you get that at williambeam.com slash free book. Very clever, isn't it? Thank you so much. The show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode one, excuse me. Yeah, episode 137. See, I'm getting confused as to which episode I'm on. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>